reading to you from 1 Corinthians, the second chapter and the first verse. And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my message and my preaching was not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and the power, that your faith should not rest on the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Good evening, my dear listening friends. Again, this is Evangelist Cecil Moe. And as you know, I'm a converted alcoholic, gave my heart to Christ over 51 years ago in a pastor's home in Seattle, Washington. Then one year later, God called me to preach. Oh, friends, listen, I wish you'd have been with my wife and I in the quartet at the prison the other day. We had three services, and I think there was 15 or 16 uh, men and women accepted Christ as Savior. Oh, I tell you, it's such a joy to see men and women who their lives are shot. They're zilches, they're nobodies. But then they met Jesus, and then their lives will be changed. Hey, let's not be with you for half an hour. Tonight, won't you kick off your slippers, sit back and relax, pour your glass of iced tea or a cup of coffee, now that winter's coming. Let's see what the Lord has for us, okay? If you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to the 15th chapter of Luke. And let's begin reading with the 7th verse. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what a woman, uh, if she has ten silver coins and loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I had lost. In the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. I've labeled this joy just over one saved person. You know, the scriptures are so very plain. Well, I guess, first of all, I want to tell you, I'm so thankful for Reverend Tom Baird, the man that introduced me to Christ 51 years ago. I never dreamed what God wanted for my life after I was saved. I was happy. I was going to church. I followed the Lord in New Testament baptism. And I was studying my Bible and, and, and witnessing. And I thought, well, that probably is what it's all about. Oh, but my friends, if that's all you got, you're missing out on some real joys. There's more to Christianity than just going to church and even reading your Bible and even praying. The Lord has a job for every blessed one of us, but very few find that job because they're not interested in souls. Well, you know what it tells us in Revelation 5, 9, And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy art thou to take the book and to break its seals, for thou wast slain and did purchase for God with thy blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And thou hast made them to be a kingdom of priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Oh, listen, to also Revelation 19, 6. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty pearls of thunder, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Well, Christians <clears throat> go to heaven when they die. Well, what do they do? Well, how much do they know of earth's happenings? Here's one thing that brings heaven joy, the salvation of sinners. Joy in the presence of the angels of God, not necessarily by the angels, but in their presence. Christians who have gone to heaven rejoice every earthly conversion, making heaven's inhabitants happy. Folks, many, many, many. You know, I, I'm not one to run around and preach about miracles. Well, I know God works miracles, and I am a miracle because he saved this old drunk. But let me tell you what happened. I was a director of the mission in Grand Forest, North Dakota. 
And uh, my wife and I was busy working in the office one day. Uh, uh, two women from the welfare department brought this young lady, about 20 years old, and said to me, uh, Pastor, can you... Uh, you and your wife watch over this girl while we're over to the courts. We're getting papers to commit her into the mental institution. Now, this really, really happened. So this girl, about 20 years old, we sat her in a chair. So she kind of was between me and my wife. My wife's desk was over by the door, and mine was back in the back. And I looked at that pretty little girl, and I thought, what in the world's happened? Why are they putting that lady into the mental institution? So my wife and I start talking back and forth, and I said, isn't it a shame that this young lady has to go to a mental institution? Because I visited down there, and there, there's not one place that you want to spend much time. And I said, I'll venture to say nobody in this world's ever told her that God loved her. And let me tell you what I saw. All of a sudden, I noticed a tear streaking down the cheek of that young lady. And uh, we talked on a a while and pretty soon she began to get a kind of expressions in her face like she knew what was going on she was hearing what my wife and I was saying even though when she came in there if you'd have put your hand in front of her eyes she wouldn't have battered him she was out of it finally I said to this girl I said young lady has anybody ever told you about God's love and she said no she answered no so my wife and I proceeded to share the gospel with this young lady. And the more we talked, the more her face lit up. And pretty soon I said to her, I said, young lady, let me ask you. If you ask Jesus to forgive, would you like to ask Jesus to forgive you and, and to come into your heart and save? And she said, I would. The three of us knelt there and that young lady, we led her in a sinner's prayer and she accepted Christ. And when the welfare ladies come there to take her away, she was eating donuts, drinking coffee, and laughing and joking. They said, what has happened to her? I said, she gave her heart to Jesus. Folks, I can tell you story after story where I saw God restore their mind to them. I have been in hospitals when people were in comas and... Uh, prayed with them and come back later and talk to them about Jesus. I remember a Mormon uh, bishop was in the hospital. He had had a terrible stroke. And uh, I said, well, I got to go see him. So I talked with him and he couldn't talk back because he couldn't talk. So I took him by the hand and I said, let me tell you about Jesus. So I shared Christ with this bishop. And pretty soon... I said, would you mind if I would uh, pray with you? And he said, you know, squeeze my hand. He didn't say, squeeze my hand. So I prayed, and then I left. And, oh, about three days later, I felt I had to go back there again. And I went back there, and there he was, still in an oxygen tent. And I said, the Lord sent me back again to tell you one more time about Jesus. And I said, now, listen, as I shared with him, I said, I, I, it means you can't talk. We're going to have to use hand signals. Now, would you like to put your trust in Jesus? If so, squeeze my hand once. If you don't want me to tell you any more about Jesus, squeeze my hand twice. He squeezed my hand once. I said, if you'd like to repeat the sinner's prayer and receive Christ in your heart, squeeze my hand once. If you don't want to, squeeze my hand twice. He squeezed my hand once. And I prayed with him and led him in the sinner's prayer. And he, shortly after that, he passed away. Someone said, Cecil, you don't really believe that Jesus saved that man. I certainly do. One time I was called to the uh, pastor from up in the mountains, about 150 miles from here. said, Cecil, you've preached in my church, and we have a, a family up here that their loved one is dying of cancer at the veterans' hospital. Would you, be, would you go see him and talk to him? He's a terrible alcoholic, and, and they don't want him to go to hell. Well, naturally, they didn't want to go to hell. So I went over to the hospital, and he was crying. Terrible pain. Can't talk. And he had cancer of the tongue and the throat. So I shared Jesus. But the minute I put my hand on him, not that that was an important thing, but I put my hand on him, and I said, My name is Cecil Moe, and I am a radio preacher here in Denver. And uh, your family love you, and they wanted me to come tell you how I met Jesus. So I shared my testimony with him, and finally I said to him, I said, 
is this what you'd like to do? Would you like to give your heart to Jesus? Now, I said, just squeeze my hand once if, you're, if you want me to. Otherwise, don't squeeze it at all. And he squeezed my hand real, real hard. And I led that man in a sinner's prayer. And folks, he died, oh, I guess a couple, three days later. His family said they never saw such peace in a man's mind. You say, Cecil, God doesn't save people who live wicked lives on their deathbed. Who, 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 who are you to say that? My Bible tells me that God would go to the very, right the very doors of hell to save a sinner who would repent of their sins. Well, why? Because of the importance of the soul. The Bible says in Mark 8, 36, What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? The mad race in this world is to possess things and have riches and gold and, 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 and stumble over people to climb up that corporate ladder. They think that's what life is. But title deed to the entire earth would not be enough to compensate for the loss of the soul. How much attention do we give to the body? Oh, have you ever been to a gymnasium and watched these bodybuilders? They put big mirrors in front of them so they can watch their biceps and their triceps and whatever they had. And they put oil on their body and, oh, it's pathetic. But did you know what? That don't mean a hill of beans. Doesn't mean a thing. Dressing up the body, fixing up the body, facelifts. Oh, women spend millions of dollars to keep from having a little wrinkle. You know what I'm saying? Men does everything, do everything they can to, to look good in their muscles and their abs. Oh, that won't be worth a hill of beans because you're going to get a new body when you're saved. When we go to heaven, we're going to be have a whole new body, changed everything. But, you know, there's very little tension given to the soul. Now, here's the importance of soul winning. Because of the increase of heaven's population, every soul one is one more that will be on the joy there. Joy that is shared is multiplied. The indescribable blessings there, the beauties, the fellowship there with the saints and with the Lord. Did you know what? I've said this many times. I've got two brothers, two sisters, a mom and a dad in heaven. Oh, don't you think there's going to be a, re a reunion with the Moes? Oh, we're going to rejoice. Oh, we're going to rejoice. But more than that, the fact that we will get to see Jesus hug his neck and thank him. See, all the things in this life I've ever been given is because of Jesus. At the darkest hour of my life, I found out that he was real. Some of you tonight have loved ones who are alcoholics. You've given up on them. Some of you have given up on your uh, friends who are drug addicts. And some of you have given up on your children. You quit praying. Listen, I prayed for my oldest brother for 26 years before I introduced him to Christ. I prayed for my baby brother for 23 years before he was saved and he went to heaven. But, <clears throat> see, he could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone. Just think, sinless, without a bit of sin on him, and yet, for that one time, he took your sins and my sins upon him. And because he took our sins upon him, God Almighty had to turn his back on him. Turn his back on him. And Jesus cried out, Oh, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You know why he did it. Because God can't look on sin. He sure can't. Well, all that is involved in his suffering and death for us, his sufferings at Gethsemane, his trial, his scourging, the crucifixion, Peter said, the precious blood of Jesus. That was a purpose of redemption because of the reality of hell. Oh, dear friends, I was in prison today and I told those men, listen, I say this with love in my heart. You have to get saved on this side of eternity. Some of you here 
and I knew there was a lot of Catholics in there. Some of you really honestly believe that after you die, you'll go to purgatory, <clears throat> and the priest can pray you out. <clears throat> well, that's not true. And first, the matter is, if you take the Douay version of the Bible, you won't find it in there. You'll find it in side notes. They say, well, we don't know there's a, a purgatory, but we believe there should be. <laughs> Each one saved is another plucked from the burning fire. Look at Luke 16, 9 through 31, the rich man and Lazarus. Now, the rich man had everything he ever wanted in his life, and uh, they would shake the tablecloth and the crumbs and Lazarus would go lick those crumbs up. The dogs would lick his sores. The dog had more compassion on that Lazarus than the rich man. But one day, the Bible said, they died. Now, the rich man went straight to hell. Lazarus went to the bosom of Abraham. And then uh, the rich man looked up into heaven and said, Oh, send Lazarus down there to tip his finger in water, for I am in torment in these flames. And then he said, Oh, send someone back, for I have five brethren on this in this world. Don't let them come to this place. And he said, No, there's a great gulf fixed between you and here. And there's no way. They had the priests and the preachers and the prophets, but they would not listen. Oh, friends, listen, there is a burning hell at the end of a Christless eternity. Believe me. You say, well, I'm going to take my chances. Oh, don't take your chance. I'll do it tomorrow. Well, tomorrow may never come. Did you know we had a police officer sitting down here in civilian clothes, just sitting there to a stoplight and getting ready to go across the street? A guy came by in the car and blew his brains out. For no unknown reason, no one knows why. Do you think he thought he would be in eternity in one second? It could happen to any of us. It is amazing what people will risk for a little money. The trade-off doesn't make sense to me. Something in the area of pleasure for a season. Listen, the joy of heaven compared to the awfulness of hell. It's kind of a forgotten doctrine. See, a lot of people won't go where preachers say that there's a hell because they don't want to hear it. I didn't want to hear it either. But I knew there was because I knew the Bible was true and I knew my mom and dad were Christians and they used to read the Bible to us. We used to go to a little Sunday school up in a, an old uh, Masonic temple. Well, friends, you know what makes heaven glad? When you and I are out winning souls to Christ. Reach out to the lost sinners every day the lost sheep. But friends, I want you to know Jesus is still seeking the lost ones today. You say, Cecil, I'm going to tell you what. I'm not a drunkard, and I don't smoke, and I don't cuss, and I'm good to my wife, and I pay my bills. Surely that ought to be enough. It isn't. You might even belong to a church. You might even been baptized. That's not enough. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Have you been born again? Or are you a lost church member? Oh, you can answer that. I can't. You're the only one that can answer that right now. And if you are lost and you feel it tugging at your heart and you'd like to trust Jesus, you know what I want you to do. I just want you to say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Most people don't really believe they're bad sinners. But we are sinners. All of sin that comes short of the glory of God. You say, all right, Cecil, I know I'm a sinner. Yes, I believe that Jesus died for me. Then bow your head right now with me and let me lead you in the most powerful prayer a man could pray in this lifetime. Dear Lord, I confess that I'm a sinner. Lord, I'm sorry for all the things I've done to you and my family and my loved ones. The best way I know how, Lord, I'm opening my heart and inviting you in to be my personal Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Beloved, if you prayed that prayer, I wish you'd get on the phone. Call 303-471-8534. I won't use your name on the air. I won't embarrass you. I won't sit down right and ask you for any money. I don't care where you go to church. Beloved, I am concerned where you spend eternity. And you say, well, Cecil, I got some questions. I Well, give me a call. I'm not saying I know all the answers. 
but I know the right one. I know Jesus. So I'm waiting for your call, 303-471-8534. No more traffic in the streets All the builders' tools are silent No more time to harvest wheat Busy housewives cease their labor In the courtroom, no debate Work on earth is all suspended As the king comes through the gate Happy faces line the hallway Those whose lives have been redeemed Broken homes that he has mended Those from prison he has freed Little children and the aged Hand in hand stand all aglow Who were crippled, broken, ruined Clad in God The chariots rumble, I can see the marching throng, the flurry of God's trumpet spells the end of sin and wrong, regal robes are now unfolded, heaven's grand stands all in place, heaven's choir is now assembled, start to sing. friends for the past half hour your host has been evangelist cecil mo i want to thank you for listening and i do want you to continue to pray for my wife and i in the quartet as we go to prisons and as we meet in this big church in the north Glen at the end of the month pray for us that god will give us souls for our hire pray for our health you know something i i have to go on a little electric scooter and I put my little oxygen bottle in the tank and away we go. Oh, what a joy. I've seen thousands of people saved over the years in prison. You know, it's going to be a better place. If you don't win them to Christ, they're going to go back into crime. I'll tell you for sure. They're going to kill. They're going to rape. They're going to murder. Well, friends, until this time next Sunday night, I want you to be good to your neighbors. Stay sweet. Keep looking up. For this wonderful, wonderful Jesus is coming soon. Good night and may God bless you real, real good. <laughs>